Welcome, everyone. Welcome back to the seventh and final session of our Mythgard Academy, uh, a little mini seminar on the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. As we have completed our read through of the book, I finished talking about the book last time, but this week, as I promised, I we're gonna come back and talk about the original radio broadcast because, of course, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy premiered as a BBC radio drama. And then the book was developed from that. Um, so, and I find, um, I find it very interesting to go back to the radio broadcast after reading through the book carefully. Um, one of the things that I find uh, right away, and Neil, no, I don't have the script actually uh, of the original. I'm just working off the audio files essentially. Um, but um, anyway, yeah. So. I was uh, I was really struck because when we uh, you know when the election results came in and I knew we were definitely doing the Hitchhiker's Guide, the first thing I did is I went and listened to the radio broadcast because I'd never heard that um, and I'd read the book before, but it had been several years since I read the book. Uh, so I read the I, I listened to the radio broadcast and I was surprised. I mean, I, I recognized a lot of things, but I have to admit I was kind of confused. Um, and I didn't like the radio broadcast as much as I expected I was going to like the radio broadcast. Um, I found it confusing, um, uh, sort of strangely segmented, you know, how they just kind of kept shifting from one event to another. Um, and, you know, that is with very much less in the way of kind of narrative links uh, between scenes and stuff. Uh, so I found myself kind of confused. And yeah, Mike, of course, the audio quality isn't all that it could be as it was, uh, you know, recorded in the seventies and stuff. Um, but anyway, it's, um, it was, uh, so, and, but the one thing of course, that really struck me most forcibly upon listening to the radio broadcast for the first time is that like all the jokes are in there. <laughs> right? I mean, almost every funny bit that I remembered from the book was in the radio broadcast. There, there, you know, elements from the book that I remembered that I was not finding there, you know, that I was noticing, uh, weren't present. Uh, but there were very, very few of the funny parts that I could remember uh, that 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 uh, uh, that were not in the original radio broadcast. That was one of the things that that really, really struck me. Uh, however, when I came back to the radio broadcasts and listened to them again after finishing our, you know, after, you know, so I, you know, since then I've read the book through twice and, you know, had all of our classes talking about it and, you know, been, so been thinking a lot about the book. And uh, uh, anyway, so um, I. I was, it, it sounded quite different, actually. I was, I was really struck by several things, having thought through the books as carefully as we had. Uh, there were a bunch of other things that I, uh, that I noticed. Stephen, that was the impression that I had, too. Stephen Covers saying there, uh, the, the, the radio broadcast at times seems more like just a series of jokes, you know, the, like, with the, you know, scenes unfolding just to set up jokes and things. Stephen, I was also struck by the, the proportions. Uh, for instance, the whale, right? I mean, the entire whale sequence is there. I, I would have guessed if you had, I would have guessed, uh, just from the book, I would have guessed that the, the whole description of the sperm whale's perspective as it's plummeting to the planet would have been very much shorter in the radio version and that he was kind of expanding it. Not a bit of it. Almost word, almost the entire thing, almost word for word, is in the original radio broadcast. And if you look at it, it's t almost two minutes long, the whole sequence with the way, especially if you add the bowl of petunias uh, onto the very end. It's almost two entire minutes of audio in a 25-minute episode you know it's like going on 10 percent of the entire episode dedicated to the narration of the sperm whale's thoughts as he's falling um i found that um remarkable uh i i i i was very surprised uh to find that and there were a couple of, that was the most extreme example but there were a couple of uh other places where i would have expected the jokes to have been sort of shortened, but again, and, and but so Stephen, this is kind of coming back to what you were saying, that it, it definitely kind of, there, the, the, that was one of the things that really, for me, kind of gave that sense of sort of a string of jokes, right? Um, that uh, we have these, these long passages dedicated to 
uh, conveying the joke with much, much, you know, what gets added in in the book more than anything else uh, is those narrative links, right? Spelling out and explaining just how from the beginning, right? We jump right to Arthur lying on the ground in front of the bulldozer. Of course, that's the that's the central thing, right? In the book, he goes back and he adds the entire buildup with Arthur waking up in the morning and all of his thinking and um, and uh, and everything else. Um, but um, anyway, so I want to, first of all, I, I, I really am interested in your own uh, 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 thoughts and responses. I have, so I, I cheated tonight. Um, this is, of course, our last class and always the challenge is, am I going to get through all my slides on the last class? And there have been one or two last sessions of, you know, Mythgard Academy courses where I've run for like three hours because I'm determined to finish no matter what. Um Anyway, uh, so I cheated tonight, uh, and I only just have one slide because <laughs> I didn't really have anything that I wanted to put up text-wise because we've read the text, and we've thought about the text, and maybe we'll want to refer back, and if we do, I'll use my, I'll use my book and read it aloud. But, um, uh, but, of course, I do have a couple passages that I want to play so that I hope we, you know, we, we, we can listen to the, uh, the audios. It's, 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 this is an audio class entirely, right? So uh, no slides. That'll be... That'll be simpler. Um, but uh, exactly, Jennifer, we're already done. We're already on the last slide, right? I have completed all of my slides tonight. So see, like, I know it like threw off the entire betting pool and everything tonight. I know. Um, but, um, uh, okay, so the, the main thing I want to do here, though, is I, I want to I kind of go a little bit more slowly through. And, of course, we're only really focusing on the first four episodes, right, of the show. I, I only want to cover the same material that, uh, is in the book, of course, that we read. Um, so looking at these first four episodes, and I want to be thinking a little bit more carefully, what is what is the pattern? I mean, I've mentioned in general, you know, sort of the overall, one of the, the major overall categories of, of what I think is added and changed uh, in the book. But in particular, what I'm really interested to think about is, again, having thought about the book and having, you know, looked at a series of... Um, you know, what I think are some really interesting themes and, and, and kind of questions that the book is asking and ways in which uh, the book is pushing us. Um, I am really interested to see, to compare that to what we get in the radio broadcast to sort of use that to be able kind of retroactively to see the direction in which Adams is pushing the book, right? Having had the opportunity to expand it, and it's pretty significantly expanded, right? I mean, the material, um, this is a little bit under two hours uh, of, of audio material uh, for the first four episodes, uh, whereas the book itself is like six hours. Uh, the unabridged book recording is, is about six hours long. It's about, it's about three times as much material, right, um, that he gets uh, in book form than he had in the original script. So uh, I think that that's... Uh, um, so again, my question is, what can we learn about sort of where he pushed it and how he adapted his own work and what are, you know, what is the status of some of these themes and ideas? Are they there in the original radio? production are those things that grew uh as the book grew you know as the as, as the material expanded a little bit uh and and sort of to look at look at some of those things um anyway okay uh let's um so let's think oh so one thing as always this is going to be so unfair I don't want to think about the circumstances of the radio broadcast. That is to say, I, I, uh, for the purposes of this discussion, I want to take the radio broadcast text as, as is. Okay? Um, and one thing also that I would want to caution, and this off, so often comes in when, you're, when we're looking at adaptation stuff, be careful of Critvik. Right. That is, I, I want us to be careful to avoid thinking about what's going on in this text, not by thinking about the text itself, but by thinking, but by making guesses about what was going on with the author. Right. Even if they're educated guesses, even if they're informed guesses. Right. Uh, that in itself, um, 
I find it can, of course, very well be of interest to people, but I find it of, li- of limited usefulness in coming to understand the text itself and coming to understand the story. Um, uh, so it's be careful about that. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, all right. One of the things that I want to do throughout look and looking at the four episodes, one of the things that I find most that I found most interesting about the the radio broadcast when I went back to it after discussing the book is looking at the framing of it. If you see what I mean by that, that is the way they begin and the way they end each episode, because, of course, that's that's done very strategically. Right. That's done very deliberately. It's uh it's a it's a really important element. It's it's, it's almost gives a kind of a guiding uh, theme. But in any case, the end, of course, is particularly an interesting kind of giveaway um, when they do. Because at the end of every episode, they have the um, will our heroes something or other. Right. You know, the, the, the questions that they ask to sort of stimulate you to come back for next time. Um, I found those particularly interesting. Right. What do they start each episode with and what do they end each episode with? Um, so, uh, oh, let's see. Mike, Mike wants to know what about the, um, the Adams equivalent of Christopher Tolkien insights given by those who worked on the radio series off limits. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. (laughs) Pretty much. I mean, it's hard. It's not that I'm not interested in that. It's just that it's a different question, right? Um, And let me explain briefly what I mean by that. If we are looking at a particular passage, right, and we're thinking about, like, what is the significance of of these lines? You know, this 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 one group of lines, like what the what they what the story does at this one particular moment in the radio broadcast. Uh, And if we know. Right. If we have some information from, you know, the actors or from Adams or whoever uh, saying, you know, giving us some sort of background for how that came to be and how oh, that wasn't part of the plan. But that, you know, is just like the actor just said that or whatever. That's, you know, OK, that's interesting, but it doesn't help me answer the question that I want to ask, because there, there are two different questions. One question is how do we make sense of the story as it's presented, right? And the other question is, how did we get the story as it's presented? Like, how, how did the story get that way? Where did it come from? Um, the process of reading The Return of the Shadow and seeing how the, especially book one of The Fellowship of the Ring, really kind of unfolded in Tolkien's mind over the course of his revisions tells us one thing, right? But it doesn't give us a key to understand the Fellowship of the Ring, right? And if we're reading the Fellowship of the Ring and we're trying to understand the Fellowship of the Ring, knowing, seeing some things about Tolkien's process and drafting and and revision history and stuff um, may draw our attention to some stuff that we might not have known about. But again, it doesn't, like, knowing that stuff or saying that stuff doesn't answer questions about the story of the Fellowship of the Ring itself, right? Um, do you see what I mean by that? Um, so, in that way, I find the that kind of background about how the sort of the script came together or whatever. I don't. It's not that I find it uninteresting. It's just that I find it irrelevant to the to kind of what I want to do, which is what I think is sort of the first to me, it's the first and most important thing. And I know it's not for everybody and that's fine. Right. I mean, I know that for a lot of people kind of getting the inside scoop and understanding like what was going on and how did this come to be is a far more kind of fascinating, um, you know, inquiry than, um, the, uh, the, the, just simply like reading the story and looking at it, but uh, you know, and thinking about its significance and, and its meaning, um, the meaning that it has, 
again, as is, right? Not the meaning that was intended, because it's not the author's intention I'm especially interested in. It's the meaning of the book, right? Um, and the meaning of the book is sometimes the same as the author's intention, and it's sometimes not, right? Um, and knowing what the author intended is, is sometimes helpful, and it's sometimes not. Um, because, of course, just because an author was attempting to convey something doesn't mean the author succeeded in conveying that thing, right? So knowing what the author was thinking, knowing even if we knew for sure, um, and that it was definitely true, uh, meaning that the author himself is recalling it accurately and and uh, uh, and everything. Um, it doesn't necess- it's, it, it still doesn't provide us a key, right? Because it doesn't that, that doesn't prove that the author succeeded in 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 conveying that thing. But anyway. Yeah, so like I said, I'm not trying to cast aspersions. Um, I think, you know, even Tolkien disagrees with me in some ways on this, right? That is, I think about the, uh, another example of a similar kind of thing. Uh, the, Tolkien's reference in, uh, in one of his, um, that, uh, I, I, wasn't it in that uh, article that he wrote? I'm forgetting the periodical that it appeared in, um, but uh, about The Hobbit, when he referred to the riddle game and uh, was sort of anticipating people who are going to really enjoy, like, tracking down to see where the riddles came from and stuff. Um, Tolkien knows that people uh, think like that, right? And he kind of thinks like that. He would have fun doing that with a text to sort of track down, like, what are, what are the source of these riddles or whatever. Um and like, I'm just like, I don't, I totally don't have that gene. Like, I'm not, I'm just not interested in that. I would rather, 10 times, I would rather um, uh, think about, like, that's why I, I did what I did with the riddle game, you know, in my book, because I'm really interested in, I'm, I'm, I, 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 I'm, I'm very much less interested in what are the roots and origins of the riddles, and I am much more interested in what is the function that the riddles have in the story that we're reading, right? Let's just read the story that we're reading. Anyway, I'm digressing now. Um, it is hard, Rachel, often very hard, to separate those two ways of looking at a work. And it's one of the reasons, Rachel, that I go on digressions like this, because I... And I I'm anticipating, and I've been anticipating even more. Remember this happened, I talked about this already, like way back in class two, because people were doing this a lot uh, in uh, in the first class, um, the first session that we had on, uh, on you know, the first few chapters of Hitchhiker's Guide. Um, and I, again, it's not that any of that stuff is not relevant or not interesting to some questions. It's just not the question that I want to answer. So, Rachel, my main thing... It's not that you should do one and you shouldn't do the other. It's that you should be aware of what you're doing, right? It's okay to uh, it's okay to be asking those kinds of questions if you're really interested in how this came about and and what Adams was trying to do and you know how that interacted with what the actors were doing and you know various kind of things that went on behind the scenes in the radio broadcast. That's a that's a perfectly legitimate thing to be interested in, but it's not the same thing as listening to the text and talking about the story that is presented to us, right? And personal bias, that's what I like to do, right? And so that's what I aim to do. And so I'm just warning people that I'm going to be from now on steadily deflecting uh, uh any attempts to kind of move off in those directions because that's just kind of not what I'm going to be doing. Um, so, um, again, I'm, I'm not judging. <laughs> I'm not judging, just clarifying my own, uh, 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 well, clarifying my intentions about what I plan to be doing uh, in the class and, uh, and, and just kind of, you know, can sort of also sort of confessing my own, uh, my own bias uh, and everything. Um, yeah, see, Yana says he finds interesting how, um, you know, the, the actor interaction with the radio play uh, and the reception of that influenced the eventual book. Agree, Yana. That's a really interesting question. That's, that's a completely worthwhile question to be asking. Um, it's just a different one <laughs> than the one I'm asking, which is I'm just listening to these things, right? I'm listening to these things as uh, these are these are these are artistic works, right? This is the work. These recordings are the work, right? And I want to I want to 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 receive 
you know, to kind of be a consumer of, to be an appreciator of, to be a receptor of these artistic works and talk about what they're doing and what's going on in them, right? And to compare that to what we saw going on in the book. Everything else, everything else aside. Um, okay. Uh, cool. All right. Excellent. So let's let's get to it. Episode one. Um, now, one of the things, of course, that is immediately striking when going to the radio broadcast from the book is that we don't start the first broadcast in the same place that we start the book, right? You remember the book starts with the placing Earth, right? Remember how we talked about the sort of zooming out from the Earth and the, the kind of uh, teasing of... I don't know if teasing is exactly the right word, but like it's, we're kind of invited to laugh at ourselves if we assume that the earth is sort of the center of the universe, right? And the way that that concept is sort of being made fun of at the beginning. Um, do you remember how the, um, how the radio broadcast begins, right? The radio broadcast begins with the Hitchhiker's Guide itself, as if the book were absolutely the hero of this story, right? Uh, first of all, you know, one thing that I noticed right away, when they announce it at the very beginning, they announce one actor, right? They say, like, when they start, this has one star. They, I mean, they list the other people who do the, the, the acting at the end, right? But there's one that they spotlight. There's one who is on the marquee, right? And it's starring Peter Jones as the book, is what we get at the very beginning. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, right? Starring Peter Jones as the book. As if the book is the most, is the, is the protagonist, right? Um, of the whole thing. That is really interesting, I find. Even if, I find that really interesting just because he doesn't actually have all that many lines, right? I mean, a couple of them, but, um, not that it, it, he has way fewer lines than a lot of the uh, a lot of the other characters and Arthur. Yeah, I mean, I get it. It's like it's it's the title, right? The Enchiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It it makes a perfect sense when they say it at the beginning, right? The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, starring Peter Jones as the book, right? Sure, great, awesome, except. Again, how many lines does he get by the end? Right? How much time does he spend talking? I mean, the narrator speaks ten times as much, twenty times as much as the book, uh, uh, and yet we don't. You know, it's not. So you'd think, like, if it's just about airtime, right? It would be starring the dude who does the narration, right? Um, uh, but that's not. Uh, that's not the way that it's presented exactly. Anyway. Um, it seems to invite us to imagine that the book is kind of narrating it, right? I mean, I assume, because clearly the one who is speaking to us most, the one whose voice is most familiar to us is the narrator, right? Um, and it is almost as if we are being invited to hear it that way. Let's listen to the, uh, to the opening here. Let me see, make sure I can find it. I, I don't have, uh, I didn't get a chance to, to cut clips, so I have, uh, I actually just kind of scrub over here, so I hope uh, that'll come out okay. Let's see. It's the most remarkable, certainly the most successful book Oops. ever to I come out. I gotta go back a little bit here. Okay. There we go. This is the story of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Sort of. Perhaps the most remarkable, certainly the most successful book ever to come out of the great publishing corporations of Ursa Minor. More popular than the Celestial Home Care Omnibus, better selling than 53 More Things to Do in Zero Gravity, and more controversial than Ulan Kalufit's trilogy of philosophical blockbusters, Where God Went Wrong, Some More of God's Greatest Mistakes, and Who Is This God Person Anyway? And in many of the more relaxed civilizations on the outer eastern rim of the galaxy, the Hitchhiker's Guide has already supplanted the great Encyclopedia Galactica as the standard repository of all knowledge and wisdom. Because although it has many omissions, contains much that is apocryphal, or at least wildly inaccurate, 
it scores over the older, more pedestrian work in two important ways. First, it is slightly cheaper, and second, it has the words Don't Panic inscribed in large, friendly letters on the cover. To tell the story of the book, it's best to tell the story of some of the minds behind it. A human from the planet Earth was one of them, though as our story opens, he no more knows his destiny than a tea leaf knows the history of the East India Company. His name is Arthur Dent. He is a six foot tall ape descendant and someone is trying to drive a bypass through his home. Okay, so one thing. Listen to the relationship between the narrator and the book, right? There does not seem to be any consistent attempt to make it sound as if the narrator, of, the narrator of the story is the book or even is the author of the book, right? The way that the narrator is continually talking about the book it distances him. So, you know, he's talking about... It's not only just that he's referring to the book, you know, in the third person, which is, of course, already distancing him from it. Um, but the way that he talks about this is the story of... So Arthur is introduced as one of the people who helped to contribute to making the book, right? So that he's distant... The narrator, he the narrator, is therefore distanced not only from the book in person, but from the book in time, right? As he's sort of looking back over, uh, uh, over the book. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so Arthur Dent apparently is behind the book in some sense, right? Uh, Arthur in ways that are unknown to us at this point. Um, and uh, Tony, yeah, that doesn't make the book the... the, the okay, so I'm going to have to be careful. I will, ca- I, will, I will stop calling The Hitchhiker's Guide within the book, the book, and I will start calling it the guide, and I'll be referring to this as the book. So when I say the book, I will try to be consistently referring to the novel version written by Douglas Adams that we've been talking about for six weeks, uh, and I will say the guide when I mean the text, uh, you know, that that ebook within the story. Um, so yes, that the, the idea of Arthur's significance, Arthur Dent's significance, as being one of the people in some sense behind The Hitchhiker's Guide, uh, is not in the book at all, right? Um, yeah. Uh, and Kimber, the other, I mean, it says it's a story about a book, right? Except certainly in these first four episodes, the book itself is going to play a very small role in the book. And by the end of the fourth episode, you know, when we get to the end of the book that we talked about, there is going to be very little... In, you would have a hard time guess, apart from the title, right? You would have a hard time guessing that the book, that the guide was really that what the story was about, right? Um, yeah. Now, uh, Yana's suggesting it could be a forward to an edition of the guide, uh, you know, so that that you know, where, we, Yana, I, I, so I assume you mean like where that kind of distancing voice could be. Uh, could be, uh, you know, would be sort of appropriate. Um, uh, yes. <sighs> no. I mean, yes. Okay. In theory, sure. Like that. You're right that that kind of distance can be achieved in that kind of a, a, of a, but it doesn't, it doesn't work like a, like a forward. It doesn't feel like a forward. And here's what I mean by that. If you're writing an introduction or a forward to a text, the text itself, itself still serves as your framework, right? That is, it's only a very peculiar introduction that would tell this largely apparently irrelevant story right it's that is there's like the presumption that the volume being introduced is the thing that we're all interested in here right which is sort of the thread which underlies forwards and introductions right and even and that I don't I don't see that same kind of thing again he 
he's saying it, right? The narrator says that uh, in the audio version, that it's the story of a book. But um, my point is that the rest of the narrative, at least in the first four episodes, does not bear that out, is the main thing. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Ooh, let's see. Tony says, is, is it is it an improper approach to take the things that are added to and subtracted from the different versions and use the two versions to synthesize a complete picture of the full story? Yes. <laughs> yes, that's improper. Or again, at least that's a different thing. Right. Uh, and here, let me say, I know this is difficult that here we are. I am deliberately setting out to talk about this story with like one hand tied behind my back as I'm we're self I'm self-consciously cutting it off after four episodes, right? This is not a four episode thing. This is a this is a 12 episode thing, right? And I am artificially stopping after episode 4 just because that's the bit that was adapted into the book that we read. Um so it's a little bit it's more than a little bit. It is quite unfair uh to sort of discuss and try to, you know, think we can really fully evaluate um, the radio broadcast by only by only reading the first four episodes. And I totally acknowledge that from the beginning. And so I will say, like, there are many things which we, you know, we may sort of pose as questions or we may say, which which are resolved. That's why I keep using qualifying language, right, and saying... It doesn't, you know, it's really hard to tell. It's, it's, it would be hard to say from these first four episodes that this is really the story of a book. The book seems quite incidental, at times even tangential, uh, to the story that's being told. Now, again, I'm perfectly willing to assume that that may change over the course of time. By the end of episode 12, things may look very different. That's totally okay. Um, but I still say that it's very interesting to me that we start off with this intro and still by the end of the fourth episode it has not seemed to have borne itself out in any really significant way um yeah yeah exactly um What are some other... Thinking about the first episode, which ends, you may remember, in the middle of the Vogon poetry session, or rather, in the pause between the delivering of the Vogon poetry and the waiting for their response, right? So we, 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 we end episode one just before, um, with the ominous question, you know, uh, uh, with like, the, the demand by the Vogon to, uh, uh, for them to tell him what they thought of his poem, right? So... Thinking about that stretch of material, tell me something, what are some things that, I'm interested to hear what things struck you. What were some things that you found that you were interested to find absent? Changes that you noticed that really struck you? Uh, I'm, I mean, I have a few that I noticed that I wanted to, to kind of mention, but I'm interested to draw some conclusions together to see what sort of patterns we can begin to see uh, as we make this kind of... Uh, uh, this kind of comparison. Um, yes, Kimber, I was just about to bring that same one up. Um, uh, he says, I was surprised that Arthur came up with the idea of tricking the bulldozer supervisor uh, rather than Ford Prefect. Yeah, absolutely. That's very different. Let's actually, let's let's go to that one. I have a, I have a time stamp for that one. So let's, uh, let's listen to that. And we'll do, we'll do a close reading of that. Tell me both exactly what is different here and what's interesting about this difference. What is, what are we getting in this story, you know, that we weren't getting in the book? So here it is. So uh, Ford has just told Arthur that he needs to come with him to the pub. I'll see what I can do. It had better be good. Hello, Mr. Prosser. Not just Mr. Dent. Have you come to your senses yet? Um, well, can we just assume for a moment that I haven't? Well? And that I'm going to be staying put here till you go away. So? So you're going to be standing around all day doing nothing. Could be. 
Well, if you're resigned to standing around doing nothing all day, you don't actually need me here all the time, do you? Uh, no. Uh, not as such. So if you can just take it as read that I'm actually here, I could just slip off down to the pub for half an hour. How does that sound? Um, uh, that sounds, uh, oh, very reasonable, I think, Mr. Dennis. And, of course, it goes without saying that you uh, don't try and knock my house over while I'm away. Oh, what? Good Lord! No, Mr. Dent. Do you think we can trust him? Myself, I'd trust him to the end of the earth. Yes, but how far is that? About 12 minutes away. Come Okay. Uh... What do you notice? Now, several things, right? Uh, now, the first, first, the initial observation that Kimber was making, of course, is that it's very remarkable that it's Arthur who comes up with this. In the book, it shifts to Ford Prefect, right? Ford says he'll take care of the situation, and he's the one who goes up to Mr. Prosser and tricks him, and, of course, goes much further, right? Um, it's in the book that he convinces Mr. Prosser to lie down in Arthur's place in the mud. That doesn't happen in the audio version, right? In the audio version, Arthur just tricks Mr. Prosser into taking it as read that he is still there, right? So Mr. Prosser will agree not to, to, to knock down his house while he's gone. Um, so what is the... Um, Yes, Yana, I agree. It, by doing that, it removes any alien powers of suggestion, right? There is that kind of, uh, it's like hypnotic, like semi-telepathic thing that Arthur, that uh, Ford does, right? Um, and so I agree. In that passage there and elsewhere, like afterwards in the pub, right, we get several... Reminders, not just the narrator telling us that Ford Prefect is, uh, you know, from a planet in the vicinity of Betelgeuse, but that he is, um, but, you know, we sort of see, we, we get the alienness of Ford Prefect kind of forced upon us in a much more direct way, right? Um, so, uh, uh, so, so cool. We, uh, that's, that's definitely a major difference uh, that we see here. So, okay, so in the radio broadcast, we don't get Ford Prefect. That that attention on Ford Prefect as alien is not there. And one of the consequences of that, as Yana was suggesting, is that it does also make Mr. Prosser look dumber, right? He's not being duped or sort of worked upon in some kind of uncertainly mysterious way by an alien. Um, but he just like, that seems reasonable. Right. Um, and again, a lot of those, a lot of the lines are retained, uh, in the book or, or, uh, you know, with, uh, with only small changes, but I think it's a fairly significant difference in the depiction of, uh, of Mr. Prosser, but also of Arthur as well. Somebody was, somebody was saying this too. Um, uh, who was saying this? Um, yeah, Brian says Arthur comes off as less befuddled than he does in the book. Absolutely. Um, the fact that he's the one who's quick thinking frees himself up to go down to the pub, right? Um, instead of just being... He's... Yeah, befuddled is a good word, right? He's just kind of befuddled all the way through. And Caden, absolutely. I very much miss the uh, the business about Mr. Prosser being a direct male line descendant of Genghis Khan. Um, that adds a really interesting dimension. So, and what is that dimension, right? What is what is the effect of that? When, when that is added, when Mr. Prosser's character, that's the only time, by the way, that his name is even mentioned, right, um, in that one speech there by Arthur that we just heard, when we go back in the book and we add the Genghis Khan stuff in and everything, right? What is the effect? How does that change the story? So th think about the two elements. Well, three. Three elements that we've identified, right? Version one, in which Arthur is quick thinking and tricks the guy with a very simple trick, right? He, he Arthur looks more with it. Mr. Prosser looks more of a dupe. Uh, and we don't get the stuff about Genghis Khan, right? Versus in the book, increased emphasis on Ford Prefect is alien, right? Uh, and therefore, in that sense, Mr. Prosser as something more like his victim with the Genghis Khan stuff added on top of it, right? What is the difference in the pattern that begins to form here? Can, can, you, 
Can you see where I'm going? What I'm trying to push towards? I want to kind of push us outwards as we begin to make, to put together some of these observations to say, what is the, the kind of the bigger direction of the, uh, of the story? Um, okay, good. Jennifer says it's a hint that there's more than meets the eye to almost everyone. Yes, that's certainly true with Ford and Mr. Prosser, right? Um, we get, uh, you know, Mr. Prosser, who is just, he's a, you know, he's the a, a sort of bureaucrat supervisor, right, who's just trying to do his job, and he's trying to convince Arthur that everything's okay when it isn't, right? Um, knowing what's going on um, beneath the surface, right? Yeah, boomful, exactly. There are more grand absurdities of coincidences in the tapestry of time. Absolutely. Um, yeah, uh, the, uh, I think that, you know, so seeing that uh, there is more, and, and Jennifer, again, coming back to your idea, Ford Prefect, just everybody thinks he's an out-of-work actor, right? But, of course, he's actually an alien from the vicinity of Betelgeuse. Mr. Prosser is also, you know, uh, the heir of Genghis Khan. Um, yeah, yeah. And, Kate, I agree. We do get, as a consequence, pushed much more quickly towards the off planet adventure, right? Um, we get much less uh, detail, as uh, as Kate adds, about life on Earth, right? Um, yes, yes, we move much more swiftly to the, uh, to the destruction of the Earth. Um, and more on how we get there. Here's another scene that I wanted to look at, Kate, kind of building off that, uh, that suggestion. Um, with them in the pub, the end of the scene, I want to think about the whole book, but especially I'm interested in Ford Prefect's interactions with the, with the bartender at the pub, right? Um, so let me, uh, let me see. Here's, this is the end of their, um, of their discussion here. Let me see if I can find that. Okay. Barman, quickly, can you just give me four packets of peanuts? Certainly, sir. There you are, 28 pence. Keep the change. Are you serious, sir? I mean, do you really think the world's going to end this afternoon? Yes, in just over one minute and 35 seconds. Well, isn't there anything we can do? No, nothing. Well, I always thought we were meant to lie down or put a paper bag over our head or something. If you like, yes. Well, would that help? No. Excuse me, I've got to find my friend. Well, well then. Last orders, please. What do you make of that? Now, again... Compare and contrast. What differences do you notice? Almost everything that is in their conversation in the radio broadcast is there in the book, right? But what's different? Thinking of the book first, because we were discussing that first, what do you? What isn't there? What do you notice? Do you remember the bit that's cut out of that exchange there at the end? This is the fun part about doing this kind of comparison. All the pop quizzes. Um, yes, Tony, exactly. You've got it. That internal stuff where the where the barkeep feels Ford's distress, right? That thing about like when you're under extreme stress and that perception of how far the person is away from where they were born, right? Um uh, exactly, Oliver, right. The feeling of the distance from Betelgeuse. Uh, that is that, that experience that the bartender has, which really shakes him, right? Um, of alienness, right? He has this incredible, to him, wholly inexplicable um, uh, sensation of alienness, right? Of we- He's completely weirded out by the whole thing. Um, in this exchange in the... The only thing that hints, uh, Kimber, that the bartender does believe Ford is the last orders, right? The last orders is sort of the final joke there, right? Um, but, you know, even that I it almost sounds like he himself is making a joke, right? Like this guy just said the world is going to end, so he's calling for last orders, right? But I... Uh, yeah, it, it doesn't sound like he's really worried. In other words, and yes... Um, uh, Cass, as you point out, there's no mention of the reaction of the other people in the bar. Absolutely. Um, 
we get, you know, remember the other characters that got added? Like the guy who's trying to, who, who gets, who, who has that really pleased smile when he sees Arthur or, or Ford ordering eight pints, right? Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, in whom Ford eventually buys a drink, right? Or the, the couple who are having the dispute and, and she would be really uh, uh, delighted to know that he's going to be vaporized in a few, in a few moments. Um, there is that moment, remember, at the end of this exchange where everybody in the pub really has some kind of understanding. It's, they don't panic exactly, but there's this moment of real solemnity, right? Of, um, of like, they briefly, those people, it, and, and maybe only those people in the, in the world until the broadcast by the, Vo- by the Vogons happens, um, understand something is, something is happening, right? Uh, showing us more humanity, Oliver, is exactly how I was thinking of it. We get so much more of the human story here. And Kate, this is why your uh, what you were just saying was making me think of this, right? Um, that I think it's really uh, it's really an excellent uh, example of that. You know, another example of that again, where we just get so much more earth earthiness right and 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 again this is why like if this is not just a matter of well there's more space in the book so we can do more things right yes but the effect is to, to do different things right it's not just that there's more of the same material by add the more material that he added changes the nature of the narrative right it changes our whole relationship to the story at this point in the radio broadcast this seems a strange thing to say, but in the radio broadcast, we don't have a great attachment to the earth, right? I mean, presumably we do, but the story is not tugging on that, right? The story isn't really working with our attachment to the earth at all. Um, it's part of the joke seems to be the whole way in which the destruction of the earth is treated in a relatively cavalier fashion, right? And that's funny. That's really effective. But it the that makes it a very different kind of thing than is happening um than is happening in the book if you see what i mean it it's it, it means that the story is a different story it's it's striking a different note it's not just holding out the note longer right it's striking a, a really different note um yeah good um yeah Cool. Um, yeah, that's interesting, Kate. Kate is wondering if you know maybe, maybe that is sort of correlated with the the why it was necessary to name Arthur as hero uh, to let the audience focus. Um, the audience can focus more on Arthur here. Um, he is less the fact that he is less passive. One of the consequences of that, I think, is perhaps to. Again, Arthur's the passivity of our, and befuddlement, right, of Arthur in the book. Arthur is our connection, right? He is the one who is our point of view. Um, and if he's befuddled, well, that's okay because we're befuddled at the beginning of this book. Uh, it's, I think, meant to be sort of befuddling. Um, so if we are kind of looking around going, what? What? <laughs> what? Uh, is there any tea? Right. I mean, if that's if that's that's kind of it's, it kind of is the position that we are put in uh, as an audience. Whereas Kate, I, I do agree that Arthur, our relationship with Arthur, or sort of the position even that we are in in the narrative, uh, in the radio broadcast, is 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 different, right? We're, that befuddlement is not the doesn't seem to be. The focus, and again, think about how much, how much less is the emphasis on the alienness, right? The things that befuddle Prosser the th- most, the things that befuddle Arthur most, are, are absent, right? The thing that befuddled the bartender, absent, right? Um, so great decrease of befuddlement on everybody's part, and uh, and therefore kind of on our part too. I find this with a radio broadcast, it's much more easy just to kind of roll with it, right? And be like, oh, okay, all right, and the Earth is being destroyed. Sure, the Earth, world's about to come to an end. I get it, right? Um, there's, uh, uh, we, 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 
we have uh, a much less befuddling experience in that way. Um, how about when the Vogons appear? Do you remember there's a big change, and this is a very unusual change, uh, because... Very unusual in because the difference between the book and the broadcast is here of a very unusual kind. Namely, there's a long speech in the radio broadcast that just gets cut out entirely. That's very unusual. Most of the stuff that's in the broadcast makes it into the book. It might get shifted around to a different spot. Uh, it will very, very often get stuff added to it. But... I, I don't know word by word what percentage it would be, but I would get I would guess that a huge percentage of the script of the radio broadcast makes it into the book. Very little is in the script and gets cut um, entirely uh, in the book. But this is one part that does right. Um, you'll remember the so the parallel is different. Who is parallel uh, to the Vogons? Right. Who, who is the who is the foil of prosthetic Vogon Jelts uh, in the book? Whom does the book invite us to juxtapose with uh, with prosthetic Vogon Jelts? Who is the who is the equivalent figure? Because we have this elaborate parallel being built right with the constructor fleet and the yellow right. Uh, and all that kind of thing. Yes, good. In that sense, Prosser, right? So just as on Earth, we have Prosser, who is the one who is trying to knock down Arthur's house because they're building a bypass through. Prostatnik Vogon Jeltz then comes and he's going to he's gonna knock down the planet because they're putting a bypass through. Um, you've got the, the yellow machine, the big, huge yellow machines, right? On both sides, we have the... Um, the same, the parallel conversation, right, between like, you know, you had every chance to go to the planning office and see the plans, right, um, the, you know, with that direct parallel between, uh, between exactly, Kate, the whole you should have objected thing. Um, the, 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 so you've got, you've got um, Prosser on Earth, and then the, and then sort of the whole comedy, well, not the whole comedy, but one of the big jokes, right, is the way that that then repeats itself in the bigger, in the bigger scale. Um, in the radio drama, we get a completely different character brought in, right? This uh, lady Cynthia, whatever her name is. Let me see if I can. Let me see if I can go back to that one. See, let me see if I can find that. I can say, drink up. The world's about to end. <sighs> this must be Thursday. I never could get the hang of Thursdays. On this particular Thursday, something was moving quietly through their atmosphere, miles above the surface of the planet. But few people on the surface of the planet were aware of it. One of the 6,000 million people who hadn't glanced into the ionosphere recently was called Lady Cynthia Fitzmilton. She was, at that moment, standing in front of Arthur Dent's house in Cottington. Many of those listening to her speech would probably have experienced great satisfaction to know that in four minutes' time she would evaporate into a whiff of hydrogen, ozone and carbon monoxide. However, when the moment came, they would hardly notice because they would be too busy evaporating themselves. I have been asked to come here to say a few words to mark the beginning of work on the very splendid and worthwhile New Bedingford Bypass. And I must say immediately what a great honor I think it must be for you to have this gleaming new motorway going through your cruddy little village. I'm sorry, sorry. Sorry.
and then we get the Vogons coming in. Um, that, I don't think there is a larger scene in all of this stretch of four episodes which gets cut from the book. I, as I say, I, this is, I find this extremely remarkable. So now again, it's, uh, it's easy to start saying things like, well, he probably didn't like it, or maybe it's not that funny, or whatever, but ah, I don't care. That's not what I'm interested in. What I'm interested in is, what is the effect of cutting it? What is the, How does it change the story? What is the story like with that scene? And what is the story like without it? And how does the story kind of cope without it? Um, what is the effect of its presence uh, on the story when it's there? Um... Yeah, yeah. And, Yana, you're absolutely right. He does retain the joke, right, about uh, being too busy evaporating themselves, right? He displaces it into the bar and gives it to the woman in the bar who's being bored by the guy that she's uh, that she's talking to, right? Um, so that one particular nugget gets retained. Um, but the entire instance... Um, you know the, the the whole business of Lady Cynthia Fitzmelton's speech is uh, is cut out. Um, why? Again, not why did our Adams do it? How does it change? How does its cutting change the story? Well, before we can answer that, let's think carefully. What does it do? What is the effect of it? What? Is, so we go right from the pub. Right, we've gotten Arthur and Ford to the pub. Right after this is when we then segue back the passage I just uh, we just listened to previously of Ford and the bartender talking about the you know leading up to last orders, please. Right, is what comes immediately after this. Then segueing to Arthur running back, uh, making a scene in front of his house, and then seeing the Vogons. Um, what is uh. uh Okay, so let's make observations about what's here, right? One of the things, of course, that's most striking about that scene is the conflict, right? The fact that she is making this... It's not just that she's making this speech and what she's saying, it's how that speech is being received, right? Uh, and the angry crowd uh, shouting insults at her uh, and her own... The extent to which... Her speech is manifestly out of touch with the feelings of the people, right? As evidenced by their angry reactions, but as also evidenced by her uh, continuous... Well, well, frankly, both by the things that she says wrong and by the things that she says right, right? Um, I... Yeah, her, her slips, Tony, exactly. Um, yeah yeah that is interesting Brian Brian is pointing out that we lose this speech but we gain the scene of Zaphod stealing the heart of gold right we get his press conference right leading up to the theft of the heart of gold and that is interesting, actually, to kind of look at those two things together. That would be an interesting kind of comparison and contrast. But the parallel, as I said, um, it clearly establishes her as out of touch bureaucrat, right? Completely uh, outside the viewpoint and way of thinking of the common people, right? Um, which sets us up for the Vogons, right? So the Vogons are equally out of touch. And remember, we get that same sound, right? That same cry of outraged reaction uh, from the Earth when the Vogons announce that they're about to destroy the Earth, right? And the Vogons immediately respond back to it, right? Um, about how they shouldn't be complaining. Um... And, uh, and yet, Patrick, Patrick says, bureaucrat or aristocrat? Both, right? That's one of the interesting things, is that it's kind of both, right? I mean, she's, she's 
snooty. Her name is snooty. Her tone of voice is snooty. Uh, and uh, her uh, um, uh, attitude towards, you know, the cruddy little cottages of the poor people uh, is snooty. Um, but she's in a position of But yet, at the same time, what she's praising is not snooty, right? She's not, uh, you know, her praise of the bypass and of the service area and stuff is not aristocratic, right? Um, there, it's much more kind of uh, uh, bureaucratic. Yeah, Brian points out that she's out of touch and tone deaf, but also not in control of the situation. While, yes, the Vogons are in complete control of the situation. Um I am certainly willing to say that I do think the cutting of of, uh, of Lady Cynthia Fitzmilton uh, is an improvement. An improvement because I find the the parallel much sharper and funnier and more effective uh, in the book when we just get Prosser versus the Vogons. Especially even Caden coming back to the Genghis Khan thing, right? Um... Prosser is a bureaucrat with, like, the secret inner heart of a barbarian conqueror, right? With the Vogons, it's a little bit more, um, uh, his, um, uh, oh, shoot, what's his phrase? Uh, his, uh, his hard exterior, right? Uh, with the one that he's going to throw into sharper relief, right? He, he is going through the, the universe like a, like, he's leading a barbarian horde, right? His, uh, you know, he comes through and he's destroying planets and moving on, right? Um, so the, 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 the parallel to Mr. Prosser as the modern day Genghis Khan coming with his bulldozers and leveling people's houses, uh, and, uh, you know, raising their homes to the ground like Genghis Khan might have done, right? But it's really small scale and it's really pitiful and even frustrated, of course, right? Um, but but still, it prepares us for the sort of much more... Uh, Prostetnik Vogon Jelts, his, his job is much more satisfying, right? Um, so I, I, I agree it's an improvement, but, but to me it's interesting that attempt to sort of split it up, right? Uh, and to emphasize, because that seems to me the primary emphasis. Even the, the champagne on the bulldozer at the end... Right to to like the 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 kind of bizarre tone deafness of that, like the inappropriateness, like you're you're not even you're you're not doing it right, lady. Like it's not what the you don't do a champagne bottle breaking on the bulldozer that's about to knock down people's houses to build a bypass, right? That's just not how it's done, right? So the kind of the kind of cluelessness of that uh, is interesting, but it doesn't seem to me to kind of work as well, right? Um, if anything. It seems to me to it, it anticipates the Vogons, but it almost I don't want to say justifies the Vogons, but uh, we certainly it, it kind of uh, I don't know in it in my own response to it it has uh, an effect almost of of uh, decreasing the emotional impact of the destruction of the Earth, um, but uh, anyway. Um, yeah. Well, no, Stephen, when I say they're doing it wrong, what I mean is you break a champagne bottle, like, at a christening ceremony, right? Like, when you're launching a ship, a new ship, you break the bottle on the ship, um, you know, as part of its, like, christening ceremony, right? When it's officially named and it's officially released... It would be like what she's doing would be like breaking a champagne bottle on like the construction vehicle that begins building the ship, right? That's what I mean when I'm saying she's doing it wrong, um, and uh, that's uh, uh, yeah, it's um, it's it, it's just it's not the same type of ceremony, um, yeah. Anyway, okay. Uh,
Yeah, they were out of ribbon and giant scissors, said Ian. Yeah, except again, it's the beginning of the construction. This is this should be exactly cast. This should be a this should be a gold shovel ceremony, right? To to begin the construction, uh, rather than a champagne bottle ceremony. Um, uh, anyway, okay. Uh, listen to where episode one ends. Where do we get? So we destroy the earth, right? Notice how nobody seems to miss the earth. One of the things that's missing, one of the things that gets added is all of the parts where Arthur's trying to deal to cope with the destruction of the earth. Um, Arthur almost never gives the earth a second thought. We get the only thing we get is the harmless, mostly harmless thing, right? You know, Arthur's interest in seeing what the guide says about the earth and his disappointment to find that it only has one word and is only being revised to two words. Right. Um, but they, they could have had almost exactly that same conversation, you know, if the earth hadn't been destroyed. Um, None of the parts where Arthur is, as I say, struggling to come to grips with the reality of the fact that the world is gone. Um, almost none of that uh, is there. But let's, so let's listen to where we end up here. Let's see. This is where I want to be. Will our heroes survive this terrible ordeal? Can they win through with their integrity unscathed? Can they escape without completely compromising their honor and artistic judgment? Tune in next week for the next exciting installment of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Okay, so it's all about jokes about their plight. No reference being made to the fact that they were told they were going to get chucked out of an airlock, right? Um... You know, so like the joke is that the, the, the suspense is can they escape with their artistic integrity intact, right? Not are they going to survive if they get chucked out of an airlock. Um, uh, okay, all right. Um, this is a really interesting choice, I think. This moment, you know, partway through the Vogon poetry scene is a really interesting choice for the end of episode one. So, like, what's the story of episode one? It's not about the destruction of the Earth. The destruction of the Earth happens about, you know, halfway through, two-thirds of the way through. Um, Well, no, actually, almost exactly halfway through. The Earth is destroyed at right around minute 13 uh, of uh, about 26. Yeah, it's almost exactly halfway through the Earth gets destroyed. And then we're on the Vogon ship and we're learning about the Dentrassi and, and Ford is talking about the teasers and uh, and we get the Babelfish and the Babelfish entry from the guide. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and then we end the climax of this episode, right? What we lead up to is trouble with the Vogons. Um The story seems much less interested in the destruction of the world than it, than the book is interested in the destruction of the earth, right? And certainly we, as audience, are not positioned to think as seriously about that. Yes, Kate, exactly. It's about making Arthur a hitchhiker, right? Um, having him... We leave with him in the middle of his... It's like with Bilbo, right? Bilbo's first successful adventure, right? The Vogons... So uh, the, 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 the trolls are to Bilbo what the Vogons are to Arthur, right? Uh, his first adventure out in his new life as a hitchhiker, right? As a, an adventurer out in the wide world. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah, because Brian, absolutely, Arthur is more accepting of his adventure and less emotionally caught up in the loss of the Earth. We, as listeners, are not being invited to focus on the destruction of the Earth and what that means, right? We're going to come back to it, of course, um, but uh, but it's not yet. Uh, it, it is not yet. It is not in this story, our emphasis. Um 
now the second episode I find particularly intriguing because with that, so if the story of episode one is Arthur becomes a galactic hitchhiker, right? And, and, uh, you know, here is his first adventure, how, uh, he leaves earth behind. Oh, and by the way, it was destroyed. And now he's in trouble with the Vogons, uh, and having this interesting experience, right? Um, Notice what we get in episode two, right? Remember where we start episode two? What do we get at the uh, the the beginning of episode two? How does episode How does episode two start? Do you remember? The beginning of episode two. No, we don't, we don't get thrown out of the airlock for a while. It's not until, what, five minutes in? Nah, seven minutes in. Seven minutes in, they get chucked out of the airlock. Anybody remember? The beginning of the second episode is the beginning of the book, right? That's where we get the whole... So let's see, let's see if I can find the... Uh, the opening here. And says the book. Too much music. Never mind. I'm not going to try to scrub it. Here we go. Far out in the uncharted backwaters of the unfashionable end of the western spiral arm of the galaxy lies a small unregarded yellow sun. Orbiting this at a distance of roughly 90 million miles is an utterly insignificant little blue-green planet whose ape-descended life forms are so amazingly primitive that they still think digital watches are a pretty neat idea. This planet has or had a problem which was this. Most of the people living on it were unhappy for pretty much of the time. Even those that had digital watches. Right. That sequence, which again, almost all of the material, almost every word in this introduction in the radiation gets into the book, right? A little bit of extra stuff here and there, but all of this stuff gets in there and it gets put at the beginning of the story. Now, what is the effect of putting it here? What is this doing for us? Here, in the middle of the Vogon poetry sequence, at the start of this second episode. This sets the tone for this episode. And it's interesting, actually, to see as we go through the episode how this business about, um, you know, life satisfaction, right? This question of the, the ultimate problem that people, that, mo- that every, you know, mo- most people are unhappy pretty much of the time, um, becomes a little motif throughout the second episode. Right. And which is kind of easy to miss in some ways, because, again, we recognize all the stuff. But when you look at it in the episode, it's really it's really interesting. Right. From the uh, Vogon's question, you know, so what you're saying is that beneath my heart exterior, I really want to be loved. Right. Um, No. Right. So we have the the anger of the the Vogon's poetry and the cruelty of his infliction of it. And so, like, are the Vogon's unhappy pretty much of the time? Right. Is is his poetry expressing unhappiness? No, he has sort of job satisfaction. Right. But he doesn't want anybody else to have a good time. Um, Think of the jokes about the. Think about the jokes about the Vogon who's shouting at them. Right. The Vogon shouting officer. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, is he living a full, satisfied life, right? Even Arthur's come, you know, uh, yeah, Arthur's joke about how he really wished, li- wished he'd listened to what his mother always told him, right? Um, you know, a, a lot of these things, uh, you know, this, this sort of theme of are you really happy, right? And what is the, what is the meaning of life? You know, it kind of runs through this entire episode and creates this new theme, which wasn't there from the beginning. And that's the thing that's so different, right? We, that's there from the very beginning in the book. That gets a stem. We talked about the way that that initial description of the earth, how that affects us when it's the first paragraph of the book, right? Um, here, it's very different. When we get that same 
paragraph about, you know, the unregarded sun and the unfashionable backwater of the galaxy, when we get that paragraph after the Earth has already been destroyed in the narrative, right, it does nothing but kind of continue to not excite our anxiety or compassion, right? Or to, to continue to suppress those. Um, so yeah, the earth got destroyed in the last, uh, uh, in the last episode, but who really cares, right? Cause it's not really all that important in any way. Most of the people were pretty unhappy on it. Um, so that's, I, I, by taking that same text and transplanting it unto to the beginning of, of episode two, I find that it really remarkably changes and certainly underscores some of those changes that we were already seeing um, in the uh, in this kind of emphasis uh, of of the overall story as a whole. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly, Brian. We do view the entire episode of the Destruct when we view that from the lens of that first invitation to see that the Earth is a small thing. It has a totally different emotional uh, effect, right? From like, ooh, the Earth is only a small place in a big galaxy after all, right? And now here comes the Vogon fleet to come and destroy it. It almost raises additional compassion for it, right? Right? Like the Earth is this like huge galactic underdog that's being destroyed. Um, whereas again, when you do it the other way around, it completely changes. I find, uh, that, uh, that, that impact. Um, yeah, yeah. Steve and I agree. It, it, it's one of the passages that I find most surprising in the entire radio broadcast. Um, Stephen is saying that, uh, not hearing that bit at the beginning of episode one, we're thinking it wasn't happening at all, right? Thinking it just got cut or, you know, it's like something that's brand new added in the book. Um, more surprising to find it almost word for word present just later on, right? Um, yeah, yeah. So, listen to where we end up at the end of number two. Again, just sort of thinking about the overall framing and shape of episode number two. Uh, let's look at the uh, the end cap here. How does uh, how does episode two end? Let's see if I can find that quick. Okay, it's in minute minute twenty four there. Okay, yeah, that's what we want. Nope, hang on. No, that's not what we want. That's what we want. All right. Will our heroes be able to enjoy a nice relaxed evening at last? How will they cope with their new social roles? Seriously? That's our cliffhanger? Will our heroes be able to enjoy a nice relaxing evening at last? This are you know, this is now Arthur and Ford and Trillian and Zaphod aboard the, the the Heart of Gold, right? And that's our cliffhanger. Will our heroes be able to enjoy a relaxing evening at last? Um uh, uh Fascinating. Right, fascinating. Um yeah. It seems also like a, a sort of a structural joke, right? Like this is the point in the in the radio drama where you're supposed to have a cliffhanger, right? Um and instead there's this sort of outrageously non suspenseful cliffhanger. Right, that's not uh, that's not the kind of cliffhanger that uh, normally we would uh, we would sort of. <laughs> it does sound like a Bertie Wooster <laughs> cliffhanger. I agree, Oliver. Uh, that's right. Uh, yes, yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Good. Um, Yes, I, I do think in part that that's that kind of a that that is that kind of a structural that he is uh, disappointing ex the expectation of what you expect to hear at the end of the radio broadcast in that way. Um, good. So okay. So at the end of episode two, halfway through, sort of, uh, where are we in the, in the, you know big picture? What do we see and what have we? What have we not seen? Well, one thing that I really notice as well, 
all of the discussions that we were having as when we were reading the book about the narrator and the character of the narrator and the position of the narrator, I find the narrator very much less intrusive, um, less of a know-it-all, right? Less of a, uh, just less of a forceful presence. Uh, very rarely is he editorializing on things in the same way as he does uh, in uh, uh, in the book, right? And that was one thing that was kind of interesting, again, especially in light of that beginning of the first episode, which led us to believe that the narrator was speaking as the book and therefore was... Uh, um, uh, you know, the, the the was 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 going to be actively framing things, and he's not really actively framing things. Um, yeah. Um, well, see, Yana, that's what I find so interesting, right? It is true. Yana points out that you know, the narrator is sort of more essential inherently in a radio play. I agree with you, but that's exactly actually why I find it counterintuitive. Like, isn't it? Isn't it odd, therefore, that the narrator in the published book, where a narrator's voice is less necessary, right, less crucial, that the narrator is more of a character, is a stronger character in the book than in the radio play? I find that kind of interesting, right? Um Yeah, and Steve and I agree. I don't even know what to do with Zaphod's character. Zaphod Beeblebrox's character uh, is one of the ones who benefits most in the book, right? Without, as you say, Stephen, without the whole theatrical theft sequence, you know, without that entire introduction to Zaphod and the whole discu- discussion of his presidency uh, and everything else, um, we get have very little context for him and who he is, right? We don't get the story about him... Uh, you know, getting up to the ship where he met the other guy who became president of the galaxy. Um, uh, remember when he hacks his way onto the cargo ship, right? Um, we don't get that story. Uh, we don't get anything about him reprogramming his own brain and anything about the mystery of, you know, his own, his, his brain and his synapses and everything else. Um, we got we just we just get almost nothing. But the only story we get about Zaphod is him showing up at that party and running off with Trillian. That's pretty. And the fact that he found he says he found Magrathia, but though we don't hear anything about how he found Magrathia, and even less about why than in the book. Um, yeah, Yana, exactly. We don't even know what a galactic president is in the radio play. So yeah, Zaphod is is. Uh, uh, a bit of a cipher in the radio play. Um, his role is really, uh, really uncertain, right? Um, I mean, it's almost like he's, you're right, Mike, that he's still a scoundrel, but he's almost, it's almost just like we need a pilot for the, for the ship, right? I mean, I, really, he does almost nothing else. Um, I guess he is because he stole the ship uh, he's there to bring in the cops at the end uh, who attack them, but uh, uh, but he really is is a, is a very much less central character, um, even though he is the one who brings them to Magrathia. Um, well, let's uh, we're starting to run short on time. Let's run up to uh, episode three. Uh, because I'm really interested in what we do in episode three. And episode three is when you'll remember, as we get to Magrathia, that's when in the story I, I got, you know, in the book, I got really interested in looking at the way that uh, Adams is playing with the whole mythic thing, right? Like the mythic significance of Magrathia and the, uh, and the, the kind of tension between, on the one hand, uh, pushing back against that, but on the other hand, not letting us totally forget about it. Um, Seeing some of that stuff come out in the radio drama is one of the things that I found really interesting. So first, let's listen to um, the opening of episode three is the legend of Magrathia, right? So we get the story of Magrathia as from the guide, right? Um, ending with the, uh, the, the people writing smug little treatises about the virtues of a planned political economy, right? That's, uh, that's the end of the opening sequence of, uh, of episode three. Uh, 
so let's listen to let me see if I can find it um, and again but what I want to be focusing on is that, like, those questions of the the way that remember all the 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 effect not just the significant not just like the the significance in prose of finding Magrathea but the effect that uh, that both the narrator and uh, Zaphod were sort of going for with the discovery of Magrathea. In these enlightened days, of course, no one believes a word of it. Meanwhile, on Zaphod Beeblebrox's ship, deep in the darkness of the Horsehead Nebula... I'm sorry, I just don't believe a word of it. Listen to me, Ford. I found it. I swear I found it. Magrathea is a myth, a fairy story. It's what parents tell their kids about at night if they want them to grow up to become economists. And, and we are currently in orbit around it. Zaphod, I can't help what you may personally be in orbit around it. This ship... Computer! Oh, yeah. Hi there, this is Eddie, your shipboard computer, and I'm feeling just great, guys, and I know I'm just going to get a bundle of kicks out of any program you care to run through. Is this necessary? Computer, tell us again what our current trajectory is. A real pleasure, fella. We are currently in orbit at an altitude of 300 miles around the legendary planet of Magrathea. I don't hear almost any of that same remember the sunrise scene right the 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 awe the mythic significance is it's we get little germs of it like trillions reference to atlantis right um, but most of that uh, uh, most of that 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 sense of the mythic most of that um, uh, most of that awe right is uh, is 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 added in the book, right? We get very very little of it in the radio drama, except in one place, right? In one place, I found it done uh, in a in a in a really cool way, and that's when they're down on the face of the planet, uh, going to find the underground the the entrance uh, to uh, to to going down into. Uh, Magrathea, let me see. That would be about here. So the four of them and Marvin are down on the planet. It's fantastic. Desolate hole, if you ask me. Oh, it's bloody cold. It all looks so stark and dreary. I think it's absolutely fantastic. It's only just getting through to me. A whole alien world. Millions of light years from home. Pity it's such a dump, though. Hey, just beyond that ridge, you can see the remains of an ancient city. What does it look like? Well, it's a bit of a dump. Come on over. Oh, and watch out for all the bits of whale meat. Do you realize that robot can hum like Pink Floyd? What else can you do, Marvin? Rock and roll. I just found you where my mice were. I found a way in. In? In what? Down to the interior of the planet. That's where we have to go. Where no man has trod these five million years into the very depths of time itself. Oh, can it, Marvin? One. <laughs> that is one of my favorite moments of the entire radio broadcast. Um, the way that they put... Because, again, it's another really clever way in which they're playing with the... This the the structure, right? Uh, so you have the musical background, <laughs> right? The, and then somebody brings up the fact. Did you know that Marvin can hum Pink Floyd, <laughs> right? And it does sound uncannily like uh, uh, like Pink Floyd <laughs> in the background there, as they were as they were ta- as 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 Arthur is having his moment, right? As he's like. Wow, I'm on a planet for the uh, for the first. That's the first time we get that sense of awe, right? That we as readers are being invited to be like, hey, like Arthur, we're experiencing for the first time the awe and wonder. Now, again, notice they've not invested it with the special awe of like the legendary planet of Magrathea. It's just like Arthur's just having a moment, <laughs> and and then of course undermined by pity it's such a dump though. Uh, but anyway, it's still, it's 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 good. But then they undermine it again, right? 
by uh, by pointing out that the the background the 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 really cool mood background music is fake. It's just it's just Marvin humming Pink Floyd, which is then parodied by uh, by him. You know, starting the uh, rock and roll music song, right? Um, but then, of course, how we then play uh, immediately the same joke again with Zephod beginning to 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 say his most grandiose, the only time that we really do move up to that mythic level, right? Of a, it, you know, into, into the very, uh, uh, you know, entering into to time and space itself, and. and Marvin is is playing also Sprague Zarathustra in the background, right? Uh, ending with Can it, Marvin? Um, I think that's um, uh, I think that's that's pretty awesome, right? I love the way that they're playing with that. But even the jokes that they're making here, it here I think we we can see the seeds of the way that in which we as readers are being sort of pushed and pulled at the same time throughout those sequences as I was arguing anyway um but uh but it's it because we do just for a moment twice right get lost in the kind of awe and wonder of things right but then we get we get immediately sort of ripped back and I feel like I feel like those moments are undermined more forcibly here in the radio broadcast. Um, I can at Marvin is more of an undermining of that epic moment uh, than we got uh, in, 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 in the book. I think that the book is more interested in that kind of, uh, in that kind of uh, uh, awareness of, of, of the sort of the wonder and the, the mythic stuff. Um, you remember where we get in our end cap what the final words of uh, episode three are? Right, Join our heroes next time for... Do you remember where we got here? This one is much... You'll remember episode three is very interested in suspense right this is where we get the story the 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 section about how uh uh you know nervous tension is an increasing problem everywhere around the galaxy so he's going to give all the spoilers and tell us that they're not going to be destroyed by the missiles right that uh, that's all that's all part of this episode right and so we end with uh let's see where are we okay here has Slotty Bartfast flipped his lid? Are Ford, Zephod, and Trillian dying in fearful agony? Or have they simply slipped out for a quick meal somewhere? Will Arthur Dent feel better with a good hot drink inside him? Find out in next week's exciting installment of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Or have they just slipped out for a meal somewhere? And of course, we know that the truth is they've just slipped out for a meal somewhere, right? They were shot at first, and so both, right? They did escape, and now they're having a meal somewhere, uh, which is, of course, the joke that uh, that we're going to get, um, you know, near the beginning, though not at the beginning of episode number four. Uh, so I like how at the end of episode three, we have the, the sort of... Uh, the disappointment of the expectations of the form right to give the cliffhanger and now this in the third one we have this sort of over the top suspense which is then you know again sort of immediately undermined um the suspense the dramatic irony is one of the primary motifs of episode 3 right all the from the from the suspense stuff with the missiles at the beginning through to the dramatic irony uh, which to which our attention is drawn very much more um, when we're told that Trillian says the most important thing that anyone said and it's that her white mice have gone missing right uh, or have escaped um, and uh, and then of course we get the stuff at the end with Swarty Bartfast revealing the truth about the mice the narrator telling us about the dolphins and about the mice uh, so everything being kind of turned on its head and and uh, uh, and Arthur asking if uh, he should just go insane, you know, go mad now. 
um, all of that stuff is the, 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 the primary shape of episode three, right? The surprise and the reversals uh, in the episode that tells us that nothing is supposed to be surprising, right? So you'll notice how we get the, the suspense, which is not suspenseful, where uh, out, the suspenseful sequence out of which the suspense, out of which the suspense is deliberately taken, right, at the beginning. And then we end with these sort of surprising reversals that Arthur and we perhaps find hard to keep up with. Um, in episode four, we come back to the surprise thing, right? The beginning of episode four. So the episodes have each started with a narr- with a narrator sequence, right? The first one explaining about the, the guide itself and what it is. The second one giving that background of the history of Earth and how nobody's been happy. And the third one giving the legend of Magrathea. The fourth one begins with a synopsis of the story, right? Uh, and uh, making a lot of fun of the Increasing, reflecting on the suspense and surprises that have been uh, 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 that have marked the program uh, to this point. So let's see if I can find that. Okay, good. A perfectly ordinary Earthman was rather surprised when his friend Ford Prefect suddenly revealed himself to be from a small planet somewhere in the vicinity of Betelgeuse, and not from Guildford after all. He was even more surprised when a few minutes later the Earth was unexpectedly demolished to make way for a new hyperspace bypass. But this was as nothing to their joint surprise when they are rescued from certain death by a stolen spaceship manned by Ford's semi-cousin, the infamous Zephod Beeblebrox, and Trillian, a rather nice astrophysicist Arthur once met at a party in Islington. However, all four of them are soon totally overwhelmed with surprise when they discover that the ancient world of Magrathea, a planet famed in legend for its surprising trade in manufacturing other planets, is not as dead as it was supposed to be. For Zaphod, Ford and Trillian, surprise is pushed to its very limits when this happens. <laughs> When Arthur Dent encounters Slarty Bartfast, the Magrathian coastline designer, who won an award for his work on Norway, and learns that the whole history of mankind was run for the benefit of a few white mice anyway, surprise is no longer adequate, and he is forced to resort to astonishment. <laughs> mice? What do you mean, mice? <laughs> he is forced to resort to astonishment. I also love the... Uh, uh, the... Uh, and they were they were extremely surprised when this happened, and it repeats this like string of special effect sounds that you don't like you don't have any idea exactly. It sounds like someone is shooting at someone, but we have no idea what occurred. And that was the whole point of the sequence: is that we heard these sounds, and then we didn't know what happened to them, and that was why we got what what we got the cliffhanger about uh, uh, at the end of the previous episode. Uh, so just to come back and say when this happens. Um, I have to admit, I am as one of my favorite forms of humor like this, or when people uh, are kind of using the form to make fun of the form, uh, and that kind of uh, you know self-conscious humor of the form that you're using uh, is something that I always especially enjoy. So I really like the ways that this radio broadcast makes fun of being a radio broadcast, uh, which is re- which is really neat. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, cool. Um, yeah, uh, Arthur, thank you for your reminder here. Um, Arthur was interested in the character of Trillian, and the main thing I would say, Arthur, I, I, I want to come back to this when we talk about the film, which we'll do in a few weeks. A little, a little uh, teaser for uh, an announcement I want to emphasize here at the end of class. Um, but uh, anyway... Uh, the representation of Trillian is really uh, is really uh, is really interesting, and Arthur was sort of looking was was interested. He was thinking about the TV series adaptation and the radio adaptation and the, and the film um, and uh, uh, and the book and how all these you know what is Trillian's role, what is her place, and um, in particular he was interested in the fact that she is visually represent, you know, she's sort of a stereotypical scantily clad female sort of, you know, kind of like the, 
uh, totally unnecessary, um, you know, bridge servant officers, you know, which were like attractive women in very short skirts on the original Star Trek, right? The one who, the, 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 the attractive female who changed every few episodes who would bring Kirk his coffee on the bridge, right? Um, and who seemed to be really only there for the sake of wearing the, those short skirts. Um, so that, on the one hand, Trillian looks like she's kind of in that role, right? And especially the way, um, as Arthur was describing, she's depicted in the in the TV series. But that uh, Arthur's argument is that she, uh, Adam seems to be kind of undermining that in some way, or at least kind of playing with that uh, sort of stereotypical fe- f- female role uh, in the story. Um, and Arthur, the one thing that really jumped out at me there, and it's because it's it's in both the same line in both the radio broadcast and in the book, um, in which Arthur, when he, Arthur is describing Trillian, right, when he's describing, rather, when he's describing this girl that he was trying to chat up at that party in Islington, um, he describes her as, you know, gorgeous and devastatingly intelligent, right? And that, that one line, that one kind of unexpected phrase um, by Arthur... Right, uh, that describing a woman using the adverb devastatingly, right, but uh, but applying it not to devastatingly attractive or devastatingly sexy or whatever, but devastatingly intelligent, um, is I think uh, that's one of the things that I would point to Arthur as a real um, support for that kind of idea. Um, now he he still doesn't do that much with um, uh, he still doesn't do that much with Trillian's character. I mean, she still plays a fairly minor role. It gets increased, right? I'm interested in the dream that she gets uh, and she does have more of a ro- more of a, a kind of a mediating role with Arthur and uh, or with uh, Ford and um, and Zaphod. And it's clear that Zaphod at least you know, considers her unequal, and we can see her being sort of the intellectual superior, actually, of pretty much all of them. Um, smartest in the group, Mike, I absolutely agree. Um, and she is, Arthur, I agree with you as well, she is the sort of the straight man. She is the serious character. She doesn't make jokes. Does she ever deliver a punchline? I don't think she does. I don't think she does. Um... But also, I would add, Arthur, that I don't think we're ever invited to laugh at her in ways that we are invited to laugh at female characters. Arthur, I, I, I can't get the, the original Star Trek out of my head, which I know is not exactly right, uh, necessarily, as a comparison, but... Um, I think about the way that, like, for instance, we, we are sometimes even invited to laugh at Uhura. Um, yeah, you're right, Flash Gordon would be better, Mike, I agree. Uh, but unfortunately, I didn't just watch Flash Gordon, so I don't have that in my head. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but Yana, I agree, she is certainly the most competent character. Absolutely, absolutely. Um... Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, see, Mike, I would be comparing it to the uh, to the to the to the classic Doctor Who as well, which is a very fair comparison. And I know another one that Arthur was interested in uh, uh, comparing Trillian with, uh, say, Sarah Jane Smith. Um, but I don't know the classic Who either, so I can't uh, I can't I can't really make that comparison. Um, anyway, okay. Uh, back to episode four. One of the most striking things I find about episode four, the whole deep thought sequence is almost exactly as in the book, right? The book adds, I would say, very little of substance Right there's some place we get more description, right, and and the 
uh, and, and, and some places where we get a little bit of expansion on, you know, dialogue sequences, but the, the whole flow of the sequence from the introduction of Deep Thought all the way to uh, his revelation of the computer that's going to come up with the answer, his t- the pattern of his repetition of the messianic uh, prophecy, right? All of that stuff is almost exactly the same as um, as in the book, and th- which I, again I find that just as I found the uh, Lady Cynthia uh, uh, Melton or whatever her name is, uh, uh, sequence significant in that it's the biggest bit that's cut out from the radio broadcast. Uh, so I found this the closeness of the whole deep thought sequence and the whole qu- uh, answer and question um, bit uh, to be very remarkable for its closeness and similarity. I don't really see... I did not notice any, and if you did, I'd be really interested to hear about it, I didn't notice any moment of departure between book and radio broadcast, which really seemed to me to introduce a really substantive change in theme. Like the stuff we were noticing about episode one, right? Like the difference of uh, uh, the, the substitution, even a simple thing like the substitution of Arthur being the one who deceives Mr. Prosser instead of Ford, right? That's a small change, but we were talking about how it has a fairly profound significance, right? And it changes our whole, it, it contributes to changing our whole relationship, really, with the planet Earth, even, right? Um, whereas in the, in, the, in the the whole, you know, deep thought sequence and the answer and the question, I didn't notice any changes that I thought really significantly um, uh, that was really that was really the same story. Uh, and I found that really fascinating. I also found it interesting, the fact that Vroom Fondle and Magic Thighs have American accents. In fact, all of the, uh, you know, uh, so do, so do Lundquil and Fook. Um, there seemed to me, and I might not have been paying close enough attention, but there seemed to me to be two groups of people who have American accents in this show. One are those, right? The uh, the pan-dimensional beings, when they're interacting with deep thought, all of them have American accent. Um, and the, uh, uh, the, the, the second group are the cops who shoot at them at the end, right? They also have, have uh, they have even more violently American accents, actually, um, Anyways, I, I, I found that kind of funny. I'm like, well, of course, Magic Thighs and Vroom Fondle have American accents. Um, to me, the most fascinating departure, and I really wasn't even sure what to do with this, um, is, of course, the culmination of the scene with the mice. Right? Let's listen to that. So Arthur gets brought in and finds his friends having a, uh, having a, a pleasant meal after all, right? Let's see. So the sequence with Frankie and Benji Mouse. I would, wouldn't you, Ford? Oh, yes, jump at it like a shot. But that's exactly the attitude those philosophers took. There's no one in this galaxy to anything other than appear on chat shows. The point is this. We are in a position to give you a very important commission. We still want to find the ultimate question because it gives us a lot of bargaining muscle with the 5B TV company. So it's worth a lot of money. <laughs> uh, quite clearly, if we're sitting there in the studio mentioning that we happen to know the answer to life, the universe, and everything, and then eventually have to admit that it's 42, then I think the show is probably quite trouble. Yes, but doesn't that mean you've got to go through your whole 10 million year program again? We think there might be a shortcut. Your agent has... Oh, that's me. Is it? Your agent has suggested that both you and ourselves have last generation products of the computer matrix, and are probably in an ideal position to find the question for us and find it quickly. No one can find it, and we'll make you a reasonably rich man. Well, we're trying to find it quickly. Go out and find the answer, and we will make you a reasonably rich man. Right, and then they, they try to talk them up to very rich, right, uh, to, 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 to extremely rich. Um, Brian, I agree, it's very hard to take the mice seriously 
with those accelerated chipmunk voices, right? Uh, and even hard to understand them. I have, uh, Yana, I have a difficult time with it because they speed them up, right? That's how they, that's how they manage. And those are normal people's voices uh, sped up. Uh, and that's why they sound like that. But it does make them, it's possible to understand them, but it's very difficult. Um, but they're telling Arthur at the end, they're not trying to, to, to take Arthur's brain and dice it. Right, they are telling him to go out and seek the answer, seek the the question, uh, and if he can find it quickly, then they will make him a reasonable. They're going to offer him a commission. They're offering him a cut on the money that they're going to get in the uh, uh, in the five day, the five D uh, lect- uh, chat show circuit, right? Because um, having the actual question will increase their muscle. They say uh, with them, that is with the five D. Uh, broadcasting companies. Um, and then, of course, the cops come in and start shooting up the place, and this is where everything gets really uh, non-sequitur-like, right? As the cops come in and start shooting things up, and then they blow up the computer thing, and then they end up somewhere else, and we're not sure where. And even the end of this episode, uh, you know, the tagline at the end of this episode is... Um, you know, assuming that our heroes survive, will they find somewhere reasonably interesting to go now? Right. So it's just like, and now we shall move them on to the next scene without any real attempt at in any way at sort of narrative continuity between this scene and the next scene. Right. Um, which is a, which is a strange move. And we see our, uh, we see Adams going in a very different direction uh, in the book, right. With the achieving some resolution to the police scene at the end, right? Um, with the suicide of their ship uh, after its conversation with Marvin. And then they still end up at the restaurant at the end of the universe, but they actually go there, right? You know, we, 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 we get them uh, traveling there uh, in the heart of gold rather than having an explosion and then suddenly finding themselves there and thinking it's the afterlife, which is, of course, what's going to happen at the beginning of episode five. Um, overall, the, uh, I think it's interesting to see some of the themes that are rather some of the concepts that are going to become themes in the book. And that's what really struck me so much after listening to the radio broadcast and then going back and reading the book again. Um, I found myself reveling in the parts of the book that are not in the radio broadcast. Like the Genghis Khan thing about Mr. Prosser was one of the first things that I was uh, really, really enjoying. Uh, because And I was, so, I was finding myself so glad that it was there uh, and learning more about Mr. Prosser and the whole way we're connected to the Earth and the way that that whole sequence goes up to the description of the destruction of the Earth uh, uh, with the horrible, horrendous noise and then the horrendous silence. Um, you know, the, the, the impact of that is so, much, is so much stronger. Almost everything that we get, almost all of the themes that we were looking at in the book are, 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 are kind of present, are, are being played with, but it's mostly playing. We get very little that's really developed into sort of themes and overall interests. Even when we do get a kind of a shape to a particular episode, like especially episode two, with the whole problem of the world and people being unhappy uh, kind of going through, and that in a way leads us up to... Um, you know, sort of prepares us for deep thought and the the answer and the question later on, but they're not really clearly connected together. Um, and you know, the like the reference to the girl who found the answer but then couldn't get to a phone in time before the world was destroyed. She's in that 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 reference is there uh, at the end of the intro sequence of episode two in the radio broadcast, but it's. Uh, uh, it's it's much you know the, the thing about the the kinds of connections that we were making between the messianic prophecies you know that that whole messianic tone there uh, in the uh, in the deep thought sequence um, back to the actual reference uh, to Jesus's crucifixion right in conjunction with uh, this you know the the person who had the answer right the person who was bringing forward the ultimate question. 
uh, and was going to provide the final key uh, to the meaning of life before the, uh, the, un- the unexpected, surprising, even astonishing uh, destruction of the world. Uh, so yeah, it is certainly more episodic in that way, Stephen. And and as you say, it's not not just because that's how it's divided up. I agree, it feels more episodic even within the episodes, right? The, it's not it it it's not uh, the episodes themselves are not really stringing together to make uh, an unfold a clearly unfolding story. Um, Episodic was one of the words that, and I know it seems like an easy thing to say, right, about something that's in episodes, but I totally see what you mean. I used to think I see what you mean, Um, because that was definitely a word I kept saying to myself when I was listening to it for the first time. We just seemed to be going from like one thing to another um, without any of the, the, that sense of, of narrative development, not just again, development of background, but, but the, these unfolding of ideas, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, building up of of, of, of themes and and uh, uh, and concepts uh, throughout the story. Again, they're all there, uh, kind of, but uh, but we don't really get them drawn together. Um, the book just becomes a better story, a fuller story, right? A story which is really interested in developing not only a narrative thread, not only more characters, um, but also really examining ideas and, and, and developing these themes and having a much more complicated relationship with the audience, right, than the radio broadcast does. Um, and and I just I th- this is not to say you know the whole point is not to be like well, let us talk about the many ways in which the book is better than the radio broadcast. It's not about it's not about you know judging it or saying that the radio broadcast isn't good. It's just interesting how much different it's the goal of the story seems to be right. Um, again, that that kind of relationship that that it's establishing with the audience. It's not just that the book does more. It's just interesting to me how different is the kind of thing that the book seems to be doing uh, than the kind of thing that the uh, radio broadcast appears to be doing. Um, uh, yeah. Um, I don't know, Brian. Uh, you know, Brian is asking a question about, uh, you know, sort of basically sort of how that came to be. I don't know. This is that's back to that other kind of question, right? Um, was that Adams's intention? Was he trying to push it in that way? I don't know. He did, right? I mean, it it is it is getting pushed in that way. Um, you know, was that his goal? If it was, why was that his goal? I don't know. Right. Again, that's where we get back into the other questions and we can defer that uh, to the people who are answering that question instead of the ones that I've been trying to answer. Anyway. All right. Well, it's getting late. I should let you guys go. Thank you for talking about the radio broadcast with me. I've had a, a good time talking about the Hitchhiker's Guide with you over the course of the last couple months. Uh, we're going to take one week off, so we'll be off next week on the 7th. On the 14th, on Valentine's Day, we will be back uh, for the War of the Ring. Uh, keep an eye out for the uh, uh, the reading list and the links and stuff. The webpage uh, for the War of the Ring should be posted relatively soon. Still have to finalize the schedule, which I haven't finished finalizing, so I'll be getting on that here uh, this week, and we'll get that out to you uh, pretty soon so that you can get yourself ready over the course of this next week, start doing some reading ahead uh, on the War of the Ring as we continue through uh, the history of the Lord of the Rings. But the announcement I wanted to come back to, we have one more Hitchhiker's Guide thing to do, and that is the Mythgard Movie Club is going to be covering the film adaptation of the Hitchhiker's Guide, and I'm going to appear up here on that panel. I'm going to talk with uh, some other folks about the Hitchhiker's Guide film. Uh, and the uh, date of that, that's going to be twenty. Towards the end of February here, I want to make sure I don't, uh, I don't mess this up. Uh, hang on, let me just double check quickly because I forgot I didn't get a chance to write this down. I think it is on yes, the twenty second. Third, I was pretty sure that was true, but I wanted to double check it. Thursday, the twenty second of February, uh, at eight thirty p.m. We're going to be having a uh, uh, a discussion of the film adaptation. So this is not quite the end of Hitchhiker's Guide fun, uh, though it is the end of this. 
uh, little Mythgard Academy mini class for now. So thanks, everybody, and I look forward to seeing you for War of the Ring in two weeks. Thanks, everybody. Good night now. The Mythgard Academy has been offering in-depth discussions of awesome books and films since 2013, completely free to attend and free to download. If you've enjoyed our discussions and would like to help them continue, please consider donating at Signum University.